Hey everyone, it's Darren Lapomi. I am the chair and professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at University of Rochester, the most underrated college town, uh, small city in America. And I wanted to talk today because it's graduate uh, recruitment and application season about one aspect of graduate applications, which is whether or not to reach out to the PI with whom you want to work before you apply or during the application process. So there are in general two types of admissions. There are, there is, but you don't necessarily know which type of admission it is when you apply. So this is kind of a behind the scenes look. Um, oh, by the way, how do I know about this stuff? I used to be director of admissions at the Department of Chemical and Nanoengineering at uh, UC San Diego for three years. I was also associate dean for students for two years and I worked a lot in uh, admissions and now I'm chair of a chemical engineering department. So um, I know uh, quite, quite a bit about this. I also got into grad school, so at least I knew something <laughs> about how to get in. Okay, so there are two kind of things that happen beneath the surface that you won't see on the website. And one is one model is direct admission uh, to a PI's group where you have to kind of reach out to the PI or the PI selects your application from the pool and then tells the admissions committee that they want this student. The other way, the other kind of extreme way is that they select the students based on cohort admission. So they pick some rubric of characteristics and score scoring, and then those students all come in as a cohort. And there are pluses and minuses to both, uh, to both ways of doing things. Um, in general, the uh, programs that admit as a cohort tend to have more money available for grad students. And there are two ways that a department has more money. One is based on TA ships for service courses. So natural science departments, so that is chemistry, biology, and physics department tend to admit as a cohort. And the reason is because to majors in other departments take their huge introductory classes as prerequisites for their other classes. And so they get money from the campus to spend on graduate student teaching assistance. So if you're in a big university with in a chemistry department and they have classes of five or 600 or even a thousand uh, students in chemistry 101, those are not chemistry majors. A lot of them are pre-meds, a lot of them are bio, a lot of them are engineers of various types, um, but that department gets money to pay for TAs and that money can go into supporting students in their first year and thus they can afford to bring on students and, uh, and, and pay them in their first year. Now, whether or not there's also a rotation student in such a rotation model in such a uh, cohort admitted paradigm is another question, but usually there is a rotation model because the students are arriving and they don't have, uh, they, they're not in a lab, so they can't get paid from a grant yet. And they tend to be paid either as a TA or that money goes through the department and they get paid anyway, even though someone else is getting the TA funds at some later date because some of those funds, TA funds in some schools are fungible. Okay, the other way that a university gets money to, to admit as a cohort so that a student doesn't have to find a PI right away is if the school is rich. And that tends to happen at private universities with big endowments or expensive universities so that undergraduate tuition can cross-subsidize graduate uh, stipend and fees. And in those cases, there can often be, uh, be scenarios in which students are admitted as a, as a cohort, but maybe they don't have to choose a lab for a while and thus don't have to get on their PI's payroll and get paid out of a grant. For example, University of Rochester works this way. The other thing that's nice about University of Rochester is that students don't get charged tuition, which means that faculty grants don't have to pay tuition or tuition remission, which is a benefit paid to the students so that they don't have to pay 
tuition. If it sounds like money laundering, it is. And University of Rochester doesn't engage in that kind of shenanigans. <laughs> All right. So um, what are some, some anecdotes uh, about this? I should say that there are some university or some graduate programs that have kind of a uh, some kind of a hybrid model where a you apply they admit as a cohort but maybe if you reach out to a professor that professor can give you a little bump in your application and then they might uh, they might say look I really want to work for this student admissions committee can you give them a bump in their uh, in their consideration and I'd be willing to take them on and pay for them out of uh, out of my grant funding Okay, when I was an undergraduate, I, this was in 2004, uh, 2005, that was my application year, and I definitely reached out to professors. One of the reasons I did this was because I was really insecure about my GRE score, and in particular, I have some kind of, I'm just going to make this an excuse, I have some kind of attention issue where it's really hard for me to concentrate on math tests and so I scored down with the uh, with the humanities majors in my GRE math even though I had a minor in physics and I took math methods of theoretical physics so I was pretty good in like calculus and stuff but I still somehow couldn't solve those problems with a time crunch um, even though they were really technically easy math problems but I nailed my verbal and writing sections and also my chemistry subject tests where I was in the 90th percentile and above in all three of those areas so um, as a Result, I got in everywhere I applied, um, except MIT. <laughs> still, And then when I got invited to give a department seminar at MIT a few years ago, I'm like, yes, vindicated. Um, so my, my uh, as a little aside here, whenever I get asked to do something for a school that uh, at one point rejected me along one point of my career, I uh, feel a little bit of um, a sense of, uh, satisfaction let's say <laughs> like oh so I, I wasn't good enough for you now but <laughs> I or before but I am now okay so yeah so I was insecure about the GRE uh, process um, and but my application was pretty good otherwise so you know what were some parts of my application well I had a I had a first author paper from my undergraduate. You don't need a first author paper from your undergrad to get into a top school. Um, in fact, most of my students who have gone to uh, Stanford, um, MIT, Berkeley, Caltech, places like that did not have a first author paper. So don't, you know, that's definitely not a deal breaker. You do need a good amount of research experience in uh, in one lab, if possible, um, or you've done a couple of REUs in a few different places and those people are willing to write you uh, really good letters. You definitely have to work hard in any of those research experiences and at the very least do posters and uh, undergraduate research uh, talks and posters. Okay. Um, all right. So when people, so my particular example, when I reached out, I really wanted to go to, I really wanted to go to Harvard. Um, I used to go on runs when I was an undergraduate student at Boston University, and I used to run around the river, and I would run by the Harvard campus, and I would look up at those, those old buildings and be like, oh, I, I really want to go there. And so, um, I, when I bombed my GRE math, I was really upset, and I, uh, I emailed a couple of uh, potential PIs, and, uh, and they said, you know, uh, well, some of them actually responded to me, and they said, um, you know, why, why did you get such a score, and maybe you could talk to your professor of your inorganic uh, organometallics class and then the uh, his former postdoc advisor was the chair of the admissions committee and I don't know I of course because I was so uh, I was such a supplicant so obsequious of course I asked my organometallics professor to reach out to his former boss and I don't 
think Eve ever did <laughs> do that. Um, but uh, so anyway, I got in probably on the strength of my undergraduate research record, definitely not on the strength of my GRE math. That's for uh, for darn sure. And um, so, OK, I, I got in and life was good for for another, you know, another five years. Um, until I applied for a postdoc and then for a faculty position, which are the topics of other videos. Okay, um, I get a lot of emails from prospective students and the vast majority of them are not good. Uh, they are clearly uh, intended just to get, like they're on a fishing expedition, like they sent the same email to 100 PIs. Um, there's, no, there's no connection between the work they did as an undergraduate or a master's student and the work that uh, that I do. And you don't need to work in the area, but you need to express curiosity for it. So there's usually no expression of curiosity for the type of work that I do. I also work in a very uh, niche area that combines a lot of fields. And I'm also very easy to find on the internet. And so there's not really much of an excuse for students not to know what I do or really what any PI does because of YouTube and Twitter and Blue Sky and talks and just public access papers that you can get. So do your homework. Um, don't send an email to 100 or, you know, or even 20 PIs. Like find a few that you're really interested in. Write them a good email. And... Um, if you're not sure if it's a direct to PI or cohort based admission process, email anyway, because you are uh, you won't get denied if you reach out and it's a uh, and it's a direct or I'm sorry, and it's a cohort admission, uh, but you will get denied if you don't reach out and it's a direct to PI admission process. And even if you reach out and you don't get a reply, you're still getting information, which is really good, which is if you write a really thoughtful email to a PI with whom you want to spend the next five years working, you know, the bulk of your 20s, and they don't reply to you, you probably don't want to work with that person. There are plenty of fish uh, in the sea. So feel free to put any questions in the comments and I'm happy to uh, respond to them. Also, uh, feel free to, to, to reach out to me by email if you don't want to make it public. Um, happy to answer any questions. Talk later. Bye.